Hello, this is Tim McLean here from the Conservative Income Investor Podcast. Today I want to give you a quick overview of how I see the beer stock industry right now. First, I'd like to tell you a story about 3G, specifically the relationship between Jorge Paulo Lehman and Carlos Brito when they deci- decided that they would join forces to make Ambev the signature vehicle through which they built wealth in Brazil in the early 1990s. According to Brito, one of the reasons why Lehman got so interested in the beer industry is because he looked around and he saw that in just about every country, the richest people, the richest families, were those who owned a brewery and had been selling beer over and over for generations. I think that's an important observation and one that's easy to ignore because it seems that most countries have somewhat of a schizophrenic relationship regarding beer companies. When you're when you're just getting started or trying to sort of break the barrier to entry, there's a lot of regulations and there's a lot of, you know, zoning issues, liquor license issues, and there's a lot of areas that don't want beer companies or beer startups to be near them because, you know, the they have some like old timey notion about you know having a delinquency effect on the community or what have you but then once it reaches a certain size once it employs thousands of people once the revenue base for taxes from a beer company hits the hundreds of millions of dollars then it becomes a beloved icon in its community it has established brands and at that point it becomes something like a money machine that just keeps churning very high profits or high profit margins on the products day after day, year after year, with somewhat low reinvestment needs, depending on how seriously you need to advertise in your area. Now, the problem for the American investor in finding beer stock investments is that for most of the past 5, 10, 15 years, your, your, your hands have been tied at finding something that, uh, that checked off enough boxes to where you could look at and say, okay, this is the most attractive investment I could make right now. S.A.B. Miller, before it merged with uh, uh, Anheuser-Busch, was like Heineken in that you had to deal with foreign taxation on your dividends, which limited the attractiveness of the in, the investment compared to a C corporation in the United States like Pepsi, Coke, or Dr. Pepper, where you could get something very similar without having to chop off a significant you know, amount to not only your local government, but some foreign entity as well. With Anheuser-Busch, the issue is a little bit more complicated because there were periods of very slow growth, there were periods of extreme cost cutting, and there's just very, very high debt on the balance sheet. Right now, Anheuser-Busch carries $50 billion in debt on the balance sheet, and after the SAB Miller acquisition goes through, it'll probably be somewhere around $100 billion. The specifics haven't been released yet, but it, it will probably be the first uh, the first company in world history to, to, to owe a... Uh, a uh, hundred billion dollars to holders of the debt. So it's even though the cash flow can support it, it's understandable if you're uneasy about buying Anheuser Busch stock because the debt burden is so high. And it's not that bankruptcy is an issue, but you wonder what kind of growth can I get when interest rates rise in the coming years and that money has to be refinanced at higher rates. If you have a business that's growing at single digits. What can you do when you have to uh, when you have to deal with moderate to slow growth as well as high interest rates on $100 billion in debt? That's just not something that you can have a clear conviction about walking into. Uh, one of the other crown jewel investments in the beer industry is Brown Foreman, which is excellently run. But the catch there is the valuation has always been so high, at least in the past couple of years, that it's hard to tell whether your turn returns will be good. Because if a business is growing earnings between 9 and 12%, but the price-to-earnings ratio is in the 25 to 
to 30 range, it's entirely possible that if the business grows at 10 or 11 percent, you might only get seven, seven and a half percent returns because of the fact that uh, that you're going to have to s sacrifice so much of your returns to price to earnings compression. And so it's just not clear. And that's a best case scenario or a realistic good case scenario. If Brown Foreman's uh, business growth ever turns out to be sluggish, you could have a situation where the price to earnings ratio goes down to 15 or 16 quickly and you're, you're investing with a negative margin of safety where you're sort of banking in very high growth and it's, it, it's a necessary condition for adequate investment returns. So that means there's really only one way, as far as I can see it, that you can get into the beer industry now. And that's uh, Diageo, which is the uh, the British company. And I don't know why, I don't know what the, the name actually means. It seems to me that some of these multinationals come up with these, like, I don't know, generic, meaningless names that, you know, like Mondelez after the craft spinoff. It's like, what the heck does Mondelez mean? How, how do you build brand equity in that? I don't, I don't know. It seems, it seems very bureaucratic, but it's the underlying brands we care about. And don't let the bland sounding name of Diageo fool you because the brands they own aren't going anywhere. They own Johnny Walker Scotch Whiskey, Jose Cuervo Tequila, uh, tequila uh, Captain Morgan Rum, Bailey's Liquor, Smirnoff Vodka, Guinness Beer, which I believe, I don't remember it. I know they have that story with the 100-year lease, but I want to say it was either 1882, I think it might have been 1886 when it was founded. So that's a beer brand that has literally supported family wealth for... 9, 10, 11 generations. So these are these are an excellent uh, brands under one corporate umbrella that is worth taking a look at. And what I find interesting is, I guess because people are worried about Brexit or the foreign currency headwinds or whatever it may be, the price of the stock is down to $103 a share, which I think is a very good deal because... Diageo earns $6 a share, and so the price-to-earnings ratio is around 17. I mean, that's, I would say at best that might be 15% undervalued. If not, it's at the low range of fair value, but it's at a price where you're getting a good deal. And anytime you find a beer company trading in the fair value range, let alone the low end of fair value range, that, that just should take precedence over all other nearly equal investments because the net profit margins are so extreme. When, when, when Diageo deploys a dollar, it turns into 24 cents in profit. They got a 24.2% profit margin, and that just funds very extreme growth. If you look at Guinness from the end of World War II until the time Warren Buffett made his initial Guinness investment in 1992, it had returned a little over 13% annually. And what's funny is at that point in time, Guinness had already been a 50 or 60 year old brand. And so it was, it was well established. It seemed like a boring blue chip, but yet it was creating wealth faster than probably anything, any other idea that, that you could come up with. And the, the Captain uh, Morgan brands and the Johnny Walker brands are even more profitable. And what I like about it is that it, and it has so much free cash flow that it can uh, use for stock buybacks and dividends without sacrificing any of the ordinary reinvestment needs of the business. If you look at it right now, the, the dividend yield is somewhere between 3.1 and 3.3 percent, depending on uh, it only pays its dividends semi-annually, so it depends on what the the uh, the end of year uh, looks like. It's in uh, they uh, pay their dividends looks like in uh, uh, the the first half of the year in June and then the second half in December. So once we see what that back end of the year dividend looks like we'll we'll have a better idea on what its yield looks like but it looks like it's somewhere around the 3.1 to 3.3 percent yield range and right now i think that people 
aren't fully appreciating the business because it recently uh, sold some of its uh, wine assets to uh, Indian businessman uh, VJ Malia. Uh, Malia. And so the earnings per share sometimes shows up as 21 times earnings. The profits show up lower, or there's just these charge-offs that, you know, three or four hundred million dollars that kind of distorts the true earnings power at Diageo. And so the fact that it owns a brand that for almost for over 50 years compounded at 13 and a half percent annually, it gives you a three percent starting yield. It gives you. Uh, Evaluation in the 17 times earnings range, and it's expected to grow earnings somewhere around 7, 8, or even 9% over the long haul. It's like if that happens and you get a 3% dividend, you're basically looking at uh, at 10% returns without the business really needing to to knock n- knock re- results out of the park. What I like about investing is you always get to choose the terms of your success and failure. The danger of high priced earning stocks is that you need the growth and then if you don't get it and the price to earnings compression happens, then you can be in trouble awfully quickly. Well, Diageo right now doesn't assume that risk. There's a time and a place for that risk, but if you don't have to take it, that's a pretty sweet place to be. And I think Diageo offers that right now. Um, You get a 3% yield, you have a chance for price to earnings expansion, and then whatever the earnings growth will be, that'll just it, that'll be your returns plus the three percentage points from the dividend. So if earnings come in disappointing and somehow it only grows at five percent, which would be historically they've never had a ten-year period where they averaged five percent earnings growth. So this would be the worst period in its history. If if that happened you would still get 8% returns. I mean, that's pretty That's pretty solid it, it, for, a, for a low case scenario. And more likely, you're probably looking at something, you know, in that 7%, maybe 8 or 9% range. It certainly has the, uh, the historical capability to do so. And its net profits are only 3.8 billion. So it's not a, uh, this isn't like Coca-Cola where you have, you know, 10 11 billion dollars in profits across 210 countries they're 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 about a third of the size of uh of coca-cola so they still have some uh somewhere to go and they're they're actually this year they're going to be more profitable per item than coca-cola so it's so it's interesting that uh coca-cola sort of gets held up as exhibit a of uh of good investments and rightfully so but at least this year diagio looks like it's going to have slightly higher profit margins per item than than Coca-Cola reports. And so I just don't see how you don't get mid single digits at a at a minimum with this. And I think that there's a very the, the most reasonable probability is probably somewhere in that like nine, ten, eleven percent total return range. And and it seems to me that the 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 uh the floor for the stock's future performance seems to be much higher than you than you get for other businesses. I just I can't see how it doesn't give you at least eight percent returns over the next 10, 15, 20 years, absent, you know, 2008 or 2009 type of stock pricing at that point. Because I can't see earnings growing less than five percent. I can't see the price to earnings ratio compressing from this point of 17 and I can't see the dividend getting cut. And so if those three things aren't a risk and then at a minimum you get 5% earnings growth plus a 3% dividend, it looks to me like the the floor of 8% is is there and then there's a better likelihood that you're probably going to get returns somewhere in the 10 or 11% range. And so I know that it's it's a boring stock. It's it's a British stock, and you know some people aren't familiar with that, or the names you know too too granular for them, or what what have you. But I think it's something worth studying because there's very few opportunities that you can find where something is of sufficient uh, earnings quality, where it's like you know what, if another recession hit, I would be happy earning this. I think during the last recession, let's see here. Sales went down from uh, 16 billion in 2008 to uh, 15.3 billion in 2009, 
and then by 2013 they were off and running again to 17 and a half billion so it seems to me that you have the situation where even if earnings even if another recession hits earnings are going to to sail along just fine and if business conditions are ordinary i really can't see you doing any worse than eight percent so so you have the downside really covered well and there's a lot of opportunity for upside and the beer industry has just minted a lot of millionaires over the generations and it's just a matter of locking in with the right company at the right time and a lot of times uh because people know how good beer companies are it's uh it's difficult to find the uh the right opportunity and i think that maybe it's the brexit concerns i don't know why the price has gotten bid low to 103 but i do know that it's an attractive entry point just because the floor is so high at this point using what i think are pretty conservative assumptions and so you know, it's funny if 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 the Brexit vote results in Britain saying that they are going to ditch uh, their alliance with the rest of uh, Europe, then it seems to me that I feel bad for the people who sell their stock. And you know, who knows? It could go to the nineties. I don't I don't know how people will react to it. I mean, that's that's kind of a sucker's game to try to figure out. But if it does, but it does seem plausible that it could result in higher than usual volatility for the stock. And I feel bad for the people who don't know what they're doing because they're, they could be giving away a gold mine asset, you know, in the 90s or whatever price it could be, when it's something where if they just bought it, sat on it, and did nothing, it would make their family very rich over the next 20 or 30 years. Just taking Diageo, sticking it in a brokerage account somewhere, forgetting you own it, and just letting the dividends pile up will make you richer. It, if, if someone did that after after World War II with, you know, a couple thousand dollars, you know, that alone would be, like, not just a retirement fund, but if you lived in a small town, you'd probably be the richest person in that town during your retirement just because of that single capital allocation. And so this is one of those stocks that once you buy it it's it's not for sale anymore it's something that you should you, you should cherish you should be happy you own it you should collect the cash you should be very grateful for the fact that you own something that has a 120 year track record is selling at a reasonable price and is still offering high single digit earnings growth over the long haul this is one of the absolute best businesses in the world. I don't think you could name three dozen, four dozen better businesses in the world than Diageo. And especially when you adjust it for its earnings growth, I would say it's probably one of the top 30 businesses in the world when you combine quality and earnings growth characteristics. So I imagine that someone who buys stock at this price of $103 or lower is going to be very, very happy with the decision when they look back 15, 20 years from now. That, that should do it for the podcast. Thank you for listening. This is Tim McAleenan, and I hope you have a good day.